Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. And tonight we have Owen talking on swarms and what to do with them and how to stop them and how to manage them. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Owen. Uh, sorry, just for technical, what do I do here? But, oh yeah, fine. Sure. Right. Okay, here we go. Um, uh, just hello, everybody. Thanks uh, to uh, Brennan Fibke for inviting me here. Uh, so this evening, I'm going to talk on uh, the principles of swarm prevention and control. Now, this is especially for beginners. This is uh, this is really what beekeeping is all about, and it's the one that is probably the most complex. And you know, beekeepers who've been at it a long, long time uh, still struggle with it um, because uh, you know the bees always uh, you know do something that's unpredicted. Uh, so. What I want to do is now the audience, I know the audience in this is very mixed. So I'll just maybe crave the patience of people who are more experienced while I maybe explain a few things about the basics of swarming and that to, to beginners. Um, and if the beginners are a bit patient while I maybe discuss some things that are a bit more complex, but hopefully I'll try and cover all aspects uh, uh, as much as I can. I'll keep it, uh, the whole thing about swarm prevention control is, as with most aspects of beekeeping, is to keep it, uh, keep it simple. Uh, so this evening, what I want to talk, I want to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about on the, the swarming process. I won't go into too much detail. There's plenty of really good books on the whole biology of swarming, and it's a fascinating area. Um, Tom Seeley has done an awful lot of work in this area, and his books are eminently readable and well worth looking at. Um, so then I want to look at um, the ideas of swarm prevention um, and then uh, on swarm control. So I'll, I'll go into what that means exactly. Uh, prevent, swarm prevention isn't actually about preventing swarms. It's, it's about maybe delaying uh, the whole swarming process. And then swarm control is where you try and take action when the colony begins to make swarming preparations. And then uh, I want to discuss two simple swarm control methods that are kind of really targeted at people who are beginning beekeeping. Um, and, and they're very, they're probably, probably the, in my experience anyway, the two most successful and probably technically easiest methods of swarm control. Just one thing. So, uh, yep. You're not, you're not sharing your slides. Just. Oh yeah. I, oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. What do I do now? Bryn? Um, Sorry, Brendan, I'm just kind of at a loss. Share screen on the bottom of the screen. I don't see that now. I, I'm off, gonna have to, I'll have to come out for a second, sorry. Oh yeah, all right. Share screen. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, How's that now? Is that Perfect. okay? Right. Okay. So, right. Um, okay. The first thing: uh, Why do honeybees swarm? Um, it's not just to annoy beekeepers. Um, it's a very unusual behavior by any organism to 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 kind of split your your uh, group, your colony group, uh, in in half and and uh, you know start off a new um, organism as such. I suppose, and really. Swarming really is the method of uh, reproduction of the honeybee. You know, when a queen mates and lays eggs, it isn't really reproduction in the animal sense because you know it, the, the you know if you regard the colony as the superorganism, and then what it needs to do to uh, kind of um, to move on is to split it into. I suppose it'd be like some simple organisms, this, this binary fission. Um, and so it probably evolved honeybees from like uh, in warmer in Africa and all that. Uh, honeybees exhibit a lot of uh, migration and absconding and swarming might have developed from that. Um, and it's also a way that um, honeybees can occupy new territories, expand their home range. Uh, and this is how after the ice ages, when the um, glaciers, the giant ice sheets started to retreat. This is how our black bees arrived here. They gradually moved by swarming, um, you know, as trees started growing where the ice had left and it became more habitable 
and the, the bees followed and they eventually crossed the land bridge into Britain and Ireland. So it was basically small little jumps made by swarms as, as they went along. So um, now swarming generally, um, I think Thomas Seeley has done work in with bees in the Arnold Forest in New York, and he calculates that basically they're uh, the colonies on average swarm about once a year. And, and generally, you'll find in cooler climates, swarming they don't swarm as much. Whereas in warmer climates, you'd have a, can have a lot of swarming, and that a colony can swarm more than once in the sense that, say, a queen who's come from um, derived from a swarm might actually swarm again. Uh, but in cooler climates, you have to remember that uh, swarming is a very expensive process because it's very risky. Um, so, and I think again, uh, Thomas Seeley kind of, I think, calculated that the survival rate of swarms is very low. I think the figure is something around 25%. So in cooler climates, so it's, it's, it's a huge investment. So generally you'll only find colonies that are very strong uh, will swarm. Uh, now, the thing is, um, uh, sorry, I'll just move on. In, so this is in the wild, colonies swarm, we'll say once a, once a year, roughly, but you have to take into account that the cavities used by colonies in the wild are generally smaller than uh, those provided by beekeepers. I think 40 liters, I think was the figure that Tom, Tom Seeley worked out. Uh, which, and the reason it is this small is obviously it's easier to thermoregulate, to keep, to keep warm, and probably for defense as well. Um, so, um, and, and so it's hard to know how naturally swarmy bees are, um, as well as that for years, beekeepers for hundreds of thousands of years, beekeepers kept honeybees in quite, quite small containers, like this is a, a skep, the underside of a skep, uh, an Irish skep. Uh, which, uh, and um, they have actually quite a small capacity. And the thing is, it, uh, beekeepers are actually bred to swarm, um, especially in, in uh, northern parts of Europe, because the flow tends to be much later. Uh, you know, you'd have the heather, uh, but you'd also have a lot later flows because um, you'd have a lot of uh, wildflowers growing in areas that have been tilled. So you had a lot of um, sources of forage that were much later. So what they would do is that they, they actually hoped uh, or the bees would swarm early and, and these are the bees that they favoured because then the, basically going into the main flow you had two units that you could collect um, honey from. So they prided and you can see in the old beekeeping books uh, it's really all about um, early swarming was favoured um, and, and of course like generally people were on hand to catch the swarms and uh, hive them in the skeps. There's absolutely beautiful um, videos of beekeepers in northern Germany on the heat heat of northern Germany and you can see them. They have nets. They can kind of predict when a skep is going to swarm and they have a kind of net extended over the uh, opening of the skep and it catches the swarm as it comes out and then they rehive it again. And they, they try and preparing the, they were used to prepare the bees for the, um, for the header flow mostly. Uh, so, you know, so for, for centuries, you know, uh, swarmy bees were, were favored, like, but in modern beekeeping, uh, you know, swarming is uh, not as desirable. I mean, it's a natural instinct of bees and it's, you know, something you should not prevent. Um, but you, you know, as I said, it is a risky business for the, for the bees. So you want bees that are not too swarmy and, you know, and a certain amount of swarming is acceptable. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so as I said, in modern beekeeping, you know, with the movable frame hive, the beekeeper can actually extend the size of the cavity available to the colony. Uh, and that plays a huge role in uh, not necessarily preventing swarming, but delaying the onset of swarming preparations. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just going to briefly go through maybe a little bit about the whole process of swarming. Uh, I mean, the general simplistic theory is based on queen substance, queen, uh, the pheromone produced by the queen, which kind of signifies to the rest of the colony that there is a fertile laying queen present. 
And as the colony becomes more crowded, uh, this, this pheromone is passed around by trophallaxis from the bees, uh, court of the bees are constantly grooming her. And then they pass that um, pheromone around from bee to bee throughout the colony. But as the colony gets, becomes more crowded and there's more bees there, uh, there's a breakdown in the, the movement of this pheromone um, around the colony. Um, and that acts as a kind of um, signal for swarming preparations to begin. Uh, this is not uh, it's, this is not the full story. I mean, it's, it's, it's more complicated. It's not, I do think that brood play, plays a role as well because you'll find that uh, colonies that have, a, where you have a lot, um, a big population of adult bees, but maybe not so big a brood nest are less inclined to ones that are, than ones that have a large brood nest. Um, but it, it's a very complex area. But, the, the basic simplistic theory is that, you know, the, um, the, the, the uh, passage of um, queen substance around the colony begins to break down. So what happens then, what we have here is that, they, you know, you'll always find these in colonies and beginners always panic when they see them. This is, here is uh, an egg, uh, sorry, a queen cup, uh, often known as a play cup. And in this case, it's empty. Um, and in, when it's empty and there's only a few, it doesn't signify anything because you will, they're constantly making this. Even a colony that has, is a swarm itself will always make a couple of these. It's just inherent in it. Now you will find as the colony heads towards beginning of swarming preparations, you will see a lot more of these uh, queen cups. But beginners tend to panic when they see queen cups in, in, in the colony. Uh, and, um, you know, I've often had People, uh, beginners, uh, um, ringing me and asking uh, in a panic because they think their colony is going to swarm. And I asked them, "Is there queen cells?" And they said, "Well, there's 37 egg uh, queen cups in in the colony, and is there eggs in them?" I've asked them, and they, there isn't. So now, so when you see a few of these, don't panic, but look into them to see if there's an egg laid there. Um, and even if, if there is an egg, even if there is just a simple egg inside in the queen cup, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're ready to start swarm preparations. Often the queen will lay an egg in the, in the cup um, and another bee will come along and remove it. Uh, there is, seems some um, beekeepers always intim also intimate that sometimes um, worker bees can actually put eggs into these and then other worker bees uh, come along and remove them. So when you, but the thing is, if you start seeing eggs in these cups, then you really need to be on your toes uh, because it means that they're, you know, going into swarming. It could be quite close to swarming preparations. So the next stage then is, uh, sorry, I'll just get my um, my highlighter. The next thing then is what we have queen cells, and queen cells is when basically you have a larva when the, the queen cup has been extended and you have a larvae, uh, the egg has developed into a larvae and basically then this is flooded with uh, rile jelly and uh, you can look into this and you'll see the larvae there floating in a huge uh, bed of rile jelly. So this is an unsealed queen cell and you know when you see these uh, then you know the swarming preparations are definitely underway. Uh, now I've got to mention like the, the number of these can vary quite a lot. The number of queen cells produced by a colony. Generally, the the black bee, the native bee of Ireland and and northern Western Europe, uh, doesn't tend to produce many of these. You know, in, in rarely more than about maybe twelve to twenty. Uh, rarely twenty actually. You know, uh, whereas other uh, subspecies of bees from warmer climates can can raise, you know, forty fifty. 80 uh, queen cells, no problem. So then the next stage, uh, then on the eighth day, since the egg was laid, first laid, uh, oops, sorry. Sorry, Brendan, I'm having, a, I'm having trouble again. What, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to move on to the next slide and it just uh, seems to have stuck. It should just should just be able to click uh, the next slide on the um, on the thing itself. Hit escape. Uh, 
Hit the escape button and then try again. No, it seems to be stuck. Sorry, sorry, apologies, everybody. Um, Just stop sharing then, and then go and. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you go, if you start sharing again, but then jump straight to that slide and just hit the start. Yeah, you're sharing. Yeah, just go down to the, the slide you're looking for. Yeah, just uh, okay. All right. Sorry. Sorry about that. I'm not. I'm not the most computer literate of people. So the third stage then is when you see sealed queen cells. Now, generally, now and one thing I've got to say as well: when you're talking about swarming and swarm prevention control, you end up using a lot of words like usually and nearly always and most of the time and generally because obviously uh, the bees don't always uh, act, you know, as you would expect all the time. But generally, so generally on the eighth day, on the eighth day, the uh, queen cell is capped. And this is the signal then for usually, as I said, for the queen to leave uh, the hive, the old queen to leave the hive in the swarm. Uh, now there's a lot of fact, other factors involved in this. Uh, like uh, the, if the weather is bad, uh, they generally, as I said, they generally don't uh, leave the colony, even though I have seen swarms come out on absolutely hor in horrendous weather. Um, but generally, they, they don't come out until, you know, the weather is, is settled. Uh, so that, you know, might be a few days after the eighth day, or it could be much later after the eighth day, it could be a week after the eighth day. Um, and they generally tend, in this part of the world anyway, to, to arise sometime between about 12, uh, 12 midday and three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, usually. Um, as well as the time of year, um, generally in Ireland anyway, it's from about the beginning of May to usually about the end of the first week of July would be the swarming season. But that varies uh, depending on the weather. Um, it, the earliest I've seen a swarm come out is on April the 24th. And, uh, you know, you can get swarms uh, late into into July. Uh, you can get them at much later as well. Um, and um, often as well, uh, the whole, uh, you know, uh, other, there's other trigger factors for swarming as well. You often find in uh, the weather patterns plays uh, a lot of um, a major role. If you have long periods of say, uh, if, if you have good water, weather where the bees can build up very quickly and take advantage of that, and then you have a long period of inclement weather, uh, you'll find that you can actually, uh, the bees uh, will turn their minds to swarming. Uh, it's almost as you have these uh, unemployed foragers with nothing to do, and then the colony gets bored and starts raising queen cells. That, that happened actually in 2012, uh, it was a really swarmy year. We had uh, we actually had a heat wave in the end of March, um, and then we had really bad weather after that for a long time. Uh, the rest of the year was terrible, actually. But uh, because of the bees built up very quickly early in the year, we had a whole in May, then we had a huge amount of um, swarming. And then and then the opposite was in 2013, where we had a horrendous spring and. That year, I think about 2% of my colonies attempted to swarm. Uh, as well, you'll find that a colony might start making um, swarming preparations, and then you might get a, the weather might change, and you might get some really good weather, and a honey flow begins, and often they will abandon uh, making the swarm preparations and actually tear down the queen cells and concentrate instead on foraging, because obviously the survival of that the colony is more important in uh, say procreation of producing a second colony. Um, so basically, then when the on on the eighth day when the queen cell is queen cells are the first queen cell is uh, capped. Usually, the swarm issues for for and the, the size of the swarm can vary quite a lot. But generally, you'll find early in the year it tends to be bigger, um, and then towards July, uh, sorry. At the start of the swarming season tends to be bigger, but then towards July they get smaller. So you could you could have easily 50% of the population leave in um, in a prime swarm, um, 
uh, no, in, in May. Um, and, and then you can also get cast. That's when then, so you have the old queen leaves, presuming she's not clipped. And I'll talk about that later. The old queen leaves and then you have uh, queen cells left and the next queen uh, hatches out and she can lead a cast. And this can go on for quite a while. In some cases, it can go, go on till there's very few bees left in the parent hive. Um, and in the last few, sw the last swarm can actually, uh, there could be a few virgin queens actually in it. Um, so the swarm leaves the colony and then it basically takes to the air and finds somewhere to settle. Now that's usually, but not always near to the, near to the colony it left and they settle somewhere, um, if you're lucky, somewhere handy, but uh, often they can pick um, you know, uh, different sites which are inaccessible. Um, and then, then you know, they, they go through the whole process of um, sending out scouts and uh, looking for a home. And I won't go into that here, um, but... Uh, so this is what you, the thing about in modern beekeeping, you, you do not want this to happen because obviously you're losing half your workforce um, off and if they're gone off over the horizon, uh, you know, and as well, they take a certain amount of honey. Not as, I think recent research has shown that they don't take as much honey as was previously believed, but they take a certain amount. But more importantly, uh, the workforce that they, you know, it's a much depleted workforce left behind. And of course, they have to go through the whole procedure of uh, raising a new queen. And uh, then, uh, and they, you know, it has a huge drastic effect on the potential for honey collection and then harvesting honey for the beekeeper. Um, okay. So in this whole swarming, I, I'm not going to really talk much about, it, but also we have supersedure uh, can also occur. Um, um, and here you have the queen here, the old queen, and there just down here you have uh, the new daughter queen, and the two of them are there together. This is perfect supersedure where you have both together. Uh, now, uh, I won't go into supersedure today, but it, it, it does occur, um, and um, sometimes uh, you will actually find that uh, swarming can actually turn into supersedure and occasionally vice versa, in my experience, can occasionally occur as well, where what looks like supersedure cells turn into uh, swarm cells. Um, now, the general difference and between, say, swarming cells and supersedure cells is, is much greater uh, than, than you know, some of the books would really believe, but generally, in swarm cells, you have a lot of uh, queen cells, and a lot of them would be generally, you know, all over the place and the bottom of the, the combs, but generally all over the place. Whereas um, with supersedure cells, you'll find that they tend to be more defined um, and they tend to be more well shaped. Um, but then again, like, you know, the, the division between supersedure cells and there is a gray area in between them. This has happened again. It seems to be any time I use the um, annotate button, uh, Brendan, it seems to seems to um, freeze it. Well, I guess. Uh, yeah, and, unless you turn and, off the, uh, yeah, you've turned off the annotate. Or, yeah, I've turned it off now, but it won't, it, it won't. Um, well, just stop and start again, I think. It's yeah, yeah, I just, I won't use the, I won't use the, uh, the, the okay. highlighter anymore. I'm just using about the this. Yeah. Uh, right, so stop, share. Oh yeah, should we, we'll let's try, we'll just start from there. No, sorry. That is it. Sorry about this, folks.
Okay, we're back, back again. Right, so what I want to talk to now is about uh, principles of swarm prevention. And, and first of all, swarm prevention is, is a misnomer because, you know, as I said before, uh, swarming is a natural process and, and you can't prevent it. So the colony wants to swarm, you can't or you shouldn't prevent it. So what you're really doing is it's swarm postponement. You're, what you want to do is delay the onset of swarming preparations. And the reasons for this is that you want to maximize the number, the population of your colony so that uh, it's as, max, uh, you know, as, uh, as large as possible when you come to the main summer flow. Uh, so, so there's a lot of these, so basically swarm prevention is really all these little tricks you use just to delay that and just to get a few weeks. Um, and because, you know, at this, this stage, when you're going into the summer and you know from May into June, the number of bees born every week um, is, is large. So basically, if you can delay your swarm, uh, onset of swarming for a couple of weeks, then there'll be a much larger population in your colony and much greater potential for producing and collecting honey. So, uh, so I go through some, some just kind of rough tips on, on that. The most important thing about swarm prevention is room. And there's a, you know, if you watch uh, estate agents programs about selling houses and all that, and they always say location, location, location. The three most important uh, things involved in swarm prevention are room, room, and room. So you need to provide room in your hive uh, for the queen to lay. And so, especially now I'm talking from an Irish perspective, the bees are coming out of the winter now and beekeepers are, most beekeepers are just getting their first look at the colony this week. Um, and you will find that there's a, a lot of stores in the colony. We get, uh, we get a lot of ivy honey collected in the autumn. So sometimes the colony can be chock-a-block with um, ivy and this is solid, solid. It's wonderful for the bees, they can use it, no problem from now on. But there's so much in in the hive that they will have to, you know, it will actually block uh, the queen laying. So uh, one way of providing room for the queen to lay is just removing a couple of these frames uh, of ivy stores and putting them aside. They're ideal if you're making up nuclei later on in the season. They're a very handy uh, form of uh, portable stores, um, and you substitute ideally. You would put in then maybe if you have uh, clean frames of drawn comb into the uh, colony so that the queen can can lay there instead. Uh, if you don't have drawn comb, if you're a beginner, uh, you, you won't have any drawn comb. Uh, so you, you can use uh, just a foundation. Um, and but if you're given foundation this time of year, you probably need to get a, a little syrup feed as well because it's still quite cool and they find it difficult to um, raise the build the wax. So if you give them a little syrup feed, it helps them uh, do that to, to uh, draw out the foundation. So you provide, and you want to, uh, each week you do your inspections, you just want to assess that the queen has enough room to lay, uh, enough comb area to lay until the next inspection. You also need to provide room for the bees. And this is really important. This is all about supering. And this is whenever I run courses for my improvers group, I always emphasize all the time, supers are not for honey, supers are for bees. Um, so you add always the initial supers is to provide room for the bees to move into. Um, and it, if you, and you know, when you put the super, it acts like it sucks up the bees out of the brood box and it obviously improves the movement of queen substance around the colony. Um, so when should you put on your first super? Uh, well, generally the rule of thumb generally is when the, uh, when all but the two outside frames are occupied, put on a super. They've lost it. Uh, Another important aspect is marking and clipping the queen. Um, and this is something, you know, that, you know, uh, terrifies beginners or people who have uh, keeping bees for one or two years. Um, and, you know, but 
it's well first of all the reason why you would clip the queen is because uh, and first of all this does, does not prevent swarming i mentioned this once at a talk you know that this is uh, marking clip the queen is, is part of swarm prevention and one person misinterpreted it as that clipping queen prevents the swarm but all it does is gives the beekeeper room to maneuver uh, so basically if you clip the queen and uh, you know on the eighth day uh, she leaves and obviously because her wing is clipped she can't fly and she usually falls to the ground um, and then the you'll find that the swarm generally mills around. They might actually go and hang somewhere for a while and then they all return home. Um, and the reason being is, and then you won't get another swarm because uh, it's say on the eighth day, so the, uh, the queen cell is sealed, but it's the first queen, version queen won't hatch out till the 16th day. So it gives you another week, say, before the colony can swarm. And it's important to remember during this time of the year, during the summer, uh, the bees are actually more valuable to you than the queen. Now, you, nobody likes losing a queen, um, and you should try and avoid it at all times possible. But it's the thing is, a, a queen can be replaced during the summer. You know, the colony can raise a new queen. But if you lose the bees and they head off over the horizon, then you know there's not much you can do about it. So clipping the queen gives you at that time. And say, for instance, you might, God forbid, have to take a, a week's holidays. Um, so it gives you that um, room to maneuver and in theory then like you know, you have you 14 days. Now clipping, as I said, clipping the queen can be terrifying. I do it by hand because that's the way I was taught. I just pick up the queen by her wings and hold her by the thorax and, and clip the wing. Uh, so, and you need, uh, you, you know, generally you need only to take off about half of one wing, uh, but I generally, whatever, she presents to me if she presents the two wings are folded and to me i generally will just uh clip what, what i can but if you you know that's the way i do it but you know there's loads of devices available now that allow you to clip the queen without picking her up uh, and some of the, I, I i've never used one but uh, from what i hear a lot of these are, are um, uh, very easy to use once you get used to it but it is it gives you um, a lot of room to maneuver when you when you clip the queen as well, one thing to note that if you have a clipped queen in your hive and the colony attempts to swarm and you have a mesh floor and you know and your, your queen is gone, always look underneath the mesh floor because uh, often she will crawl, crawl back up. Um, she can't, she doesn't seem to be able to, rarely finds the entrance again, but she can find contact with the bees underneath and the swarm will then will actually join her underneath. So you can actually have the swarm there. And um, when I started moving, when I moved to, mesh floors first, uh, maybe 20 years ago. Um, that caught me on the hop a few times where there was a swarm underneath the mesh floor. Um, and even in a couple of occasions, the actual swarm actually built comb and uh, tried to uh, survive underneath underneath the floor. So I always have a quick look underneath the floor um, and it happens quite often, especially if your apiary site, unlike mine, are, is, is well maintained or well mowed and the queen can easily climb back up again, you know, have a good look to see that she's, she's not there. So another thing you can do is you'll notice in uh, this time of year that some colonies are much stronger than the others and they come out of the winter in different strengths. Uh, the best way of measuring the strength of quantifying the strength of a colony is, is the number of frames containing brood on the colony. And this is something you should note at every inspection. So you'd look at your colony and you'd see you know, that it has, okay, three frames containing appreciable amounts of brood. And then the one beside it has, uh, say, seven frames of brood. Well, if it has seven frames of brood early in the year, uh, it is going to swarm because it's going to build up very quickly. Uh, and it's a strong colony already. So what you can do is you can actually divert um, brood from the strong colony to the weak colony, thereby is an equalization, it's called. And it, thereby, what you're doing is you're, you're strengthening the strong colony. Now, uh, there's a couple of caveats. You have to make sure that the frame of brood you're uh, transferring uh, has no sign of disease on it. So, a very good examination to see, to make sure there's no um, brood disease on it. Uh, and, and you obviously shake off the bees and you transfer it uh, across to the weaker colony. Um, you also have to make sure that the colony that is accepting 
the new the frame of brood um, is strong enough to do so because uh, to keep that brood warm, they need to sufficient bees. So uh, you'd have to make sure you take that into account. But generally, you can so you can divert uh, frames of brood from the strong colonies and move them into the weaker ones, and eventually you kind of they, they will approach uh, equality. Uh, and this what this does is holds back the um, development of the strong uh, frames. I mentioned earlier that you know I think that uh, the amount of brood in the colony plays a certain role in swarm preparations, and I think you know even though moving the uh, frame of brood across, you're you're not actually changing the amount of adult bees in the colony, uh, but it, you are changing the amount of brood, um, and it it just slows them down. Uh, you can also, you know, if you have queen cells, if you're doing some queen rearing or, or you have queen cells, um, you can, uh, say, make nuclei from the strong colony. So you could take two frames of brood with, uh, with bees uh, out of a, a strong colony and, and shake a couple more frames of bees into the, into the nuke box. Um, and you could well leave it for a week and remove any queen cells and then add a, um, a queen cell if you raise queen cell or maybe you have a queen cell from a colony that's produced uh, you know swarm cells um and uh, one thing is that you never allow a nuke to produce its own queen cells because it just wouldn't be strong enough and the quality of the queen cells just wouldn't be good as well a lot of Queen rearing methods involve using you know, a lot. You need a lot of uh, brood or nurse young bees for queen rearing, and I find uh, that you know you can actually take uh, frames of brood out of strong colonies. And, and this is how I do my queen rearing. Uh, sorry, this is just a, a queen cell being added to say a nuke that has been made up. Uh, I use what's a modified version of what's known as the Varstman uh, method of queen rearing, and this involves this is a double nucleus. So I would put it would have contain this would contain say two frames of stores, and then I would take get ten frames of brood from strong colonies. So as I go along, uh, and when I come to a strong colony, I will take one or two frames of brood and the bees on that frame and put it into this uh, into this box. Um, and then you, know, you can uh, leave it for a week, remove any queen cells that they've raised. And then this is brilliant then for uh, raising queen cells because you have a lot of the brood will hatched out in the meantime. They've nothing, they're nothing to feed. There's no unsealed larvae anymore. So they're dying to feed something. So if when you put in grafts in there, uh, they're dying to raise queen cells. And it's a very um, successful way of raising, uh, raising queens. And then you can actually, so there's, you've, 10 frames of brood and bees and this. And then when you have your queen cells, you can actually split this box up into possibly five or more nukes uh, and put a queen cell in each one. Uh, but so what I'm saying is that I, I divert uh, frames of brood from my strong colonies into this for, for queen rearing. Now, so these, those are just a few uh, kind of little tips um, you would use for, sorry, sorry, I'm not finished. There's, uh, um, there's, there's another, um, if the colony is really strong, you can actually preemptively split the colony early in the season. So um, this is this is a, when we had a national bee research station down in County Wexford here. Uh, we had it here for uh, decades here. It was closed down maybe 20 years ago, but they did some fabulous research on, um, Irish bees under Irish conditions. And uh, one of the things they used to do is that every year they split about 20 to 25% of their colonies. They would work out all the strong colonies and what they would do is they would uh, split them. And this would involve taking the queen away in a nuke with say two frames of brood and two shakes of bees um, and allowing the parent colony to raise its own queen. And they did this for all through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and all their data is uh, is published in on Bacra, the Irish Beekeeper magazine. And uh, they found that actually you would actually get more honey from splitting these colonies than leaving them in their original state. So they this they did this early. So basically, before about the 10th to 15th of May. They would do it um, depending on what kind of season, if the season was early or late. 
Um, and so there would, would about 20, 25% of the colonies, they would split them. Because these colonies, these strong colonies would go into swarming mode anyway. So what they do is they split them earlier and, and then they would actually end up with two production colonies, which together produced more than the original parent colony would, would have done so. Uh, cone building. Now, I haven't seen much uh, scientific evidence of this, but there's a lot of anecdotal reports saying that if you give bees opportunities to build comb, it kind of um, acts as a swarm preventative measure. And, and I, I believe uh, in this. Um, so, you know, you can do this by adding foundation to the, to the brood box uh, by, say, putting um, foundation in your supers or using your supers for cut comb. Uh, now, I don't uh, just just bear with me while I explain this. I don't uh, use any wired foundation in my supers. And uh, so I allow the bees to draw uh, the comb themselves. So say if, so I get a certain amount of oil seed rape honey, um, which because of our weather and the, and, and the nature of oil seed rape in this part of, of the country, it's, you know, it, it tends to crystallize most of the time before you can get it off. So you have to cut it off, cut it out uh, to process it. So you're left with a frame, you know, where the wax has been removed. So you can see what we have here is a super and the back frame is a full drawn comb. Uh, and what I do then is I have an empty frame. You can see the next frame has been cut out uh, with um, I'll see rape or possibly ivy as well. Ivy crystallizes uh, hard, so it has to be cut out to be processed as well. So what I do is I just wedged, uh, put in the, the second frame is no um, no wax, uh, no starter comb or anything, no starter strip or anything. I just put that in and then I put in another comb, the next comb uh, in between. So I put the empty comb in between two drawn combs. Uh, and what it does, uh, the bees will actually uh, draw out your, the comb on that frame absolutely perfectly. Uh, now you might have a little gap at the bottom, but despite what the books say, that frame is extractable so in, in a radial extractor. Don't put it in, you never use it in a tangential, but in a radial extractor, that is uh, extractable. And you can see the next comb, the third comb in there is actually unwired, which has been extracted. So this is, this is, you know, when I have empty combs, this is the way I introduce them to my supers. But it also gives the bees a lot of potential for building comb. It gives the, the, they're allowed, you know, they can work away in their comb. Uh, the important thing about this uh, method is that the hive has to be level. So I generally use a spirit level to make sure the hive, all my hives are level. Because if it's not level, it's slanted, the bees will actually, you know, they'll pull the, the comb out current to, to, to gravity straight down. So they might actually join the, to the next frame if it's not on the level, uh, but it works really well. But, but you know, it provides a great opportunity for the bees to uh, uh, build wax. And I think, I think personally anyway, uh, that plays a major role slowing down um, the swarming preparations. Uh, another thing is, you know, try to try to avoid promoting swarminess. Like, there's a huge genetic element to uh, the propensity of bees to swarm, um, and you'll notice this from colony to colony. You have two colonies of exactly the same strength, and some one will go into uh, swarming mode very early, and one will delay swarming for a long time, or might not even swarm at all. So it's important to recognize this. Um, and also, it's important to, you know, when you're breeding, to breed from a strain, low swarming strains, you know. Um, and, you know, as I said, swarming is uh, a natural process. But then again, swarming is a risky process for the bees. So bees, like bees that um, swarm just at the drop of the hat, uh, will not survive. Um, and, you know, when, when, especially if, you know, this, this, strength of the swarm might be actually quite small. Uh, so, you know, I think there's nothing wrong from actually breeding from low swarming strains, even though some, some recent times you'll hear that, you know, it's almost, uh, you know, the whole thing of preventing swarming is almost seen as unnatural in some ways. But, you know, as I said, like if you have a colony that only swarms every second year, that would make a huge difference. It makes a huge difference to the beekeeper in terms of time and management. Um, 
and uh, just uh, and, and the potential for losing swarms. So right, I just maybe I just want to just illustrate something about uh, what I mean by swarminess. So if you imagine a hypothetical situation where a beekeeper has two colonies, uh, and you have a low swarming colony and a high swarming colony, right? So in the first year, the high swarming colony raised queen cells, and most swarm control methods involve uh, a split. So they, they split the hive uh, and carry out their normal swarm control measures. So in year two, then they have, and, and this sec, the first colony there on the left, the low swarming colony, doesn't go into swarming mode at all. So the beekeeper doesn't do anything, you know, they don't, you know, they just leaves alone. So now I'm, this is obviously hypothetical and I'm not taking into account the factor of drones or anything, but you know, in the second year, now you have, uh, you know, two colonies that are derived from the high swarming original colony. So again, imagine that in those two colonies go into swarming mode again, and the beekeeper then follows procedure and splits them. So then in year three, what they have, the five colonies. In year one, 50% of their colonies were low swarming and 50% were high swarming. But in year three, 80% of their colonies are now high swarming and only 20% are, are low swarming. So that's what I mean is you have to be very careful not to uh, you know, uh, propagate colonies that are uh, very swarmy because you know you'll end up with a lot of colony, colonies that have potential. The low swarming colony is the colony that you should be thinking about splitting and propagating that um, there. So, and as well as this, you know, a lot of beekeepers, when they see queen cells in their colony, they, you know, seal queen cells and they will harvest them. Uh, and and, and theory, there's nothing wrong with that because they're, they're, they're naturally produced queen cells. But you have to stop and think, you know, is this colony a swarming colony or is it swarming normally? Um, and I'll just, I just, I divide my colonies up into three categories. I assess all my colonies for, for breeding purposes. I assess all my colonies on, on the basing of swarminess, I want to be better in a word. So I divide them into three categories. So I have premature swarmers. So these are colonies that are quite weak, or, you know, are, are reasonably weak and still decide to go into swarming mode. So for example, here, I have a colony that has say six frames of brood and doesn't have quite a super of honey. That should not go into swarm, swarming mode. It is too weak. Like, you know, if you split that colony, you're gonna be left with two very weak colonies and neither of them, you know, it, it's a lot of work to build both those uh, into uh, viable units and you know the chances of them producing any honey is very slim. So I would generally intervene the colonies that go into um, uh, swarming mode too early I would generally remove those queens uh, altogether you know whether that means you know just actually killing her there and then or, or, or what you know uh, because you know it's not viable in the long term it's, these colonies are not viable. Then I, they have what's called the normal swarmers Right. So these are colonies that build up normally, build up into nice, strong colonies, and then decide to start making swarm preparations. So, for example, here, you know, this colony has greater than eight frames of brood and has, you know, around one to two or more supers of honey. If that goes into swarm mode, that's natural, no problem. It's 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 fine. It's perfectly acceptable. And I would carry out a split in that colony by some swarm control method, um, and, and that's not no problem whatsoever. And then we have low swarming colonies. And these are colonies that say, for example, it has reached eight frames of brood and has uh, you know, one to two or more supers of honey and doesn't go into a swarming mode. These are the ones that I would use in my breeding program. And uh, I would breed from them. They would, uh, these are the low swarms. And I find like um, in general, it varies from year to year, but generally I find that you know between between about maybe 30 and 60% of my colonies don't go into swarming mode. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it makes a huge difference uh, with regard to management, not, to, you know, to have colonies that, that don't, they don't require as much management and you can make decisions, say, you know, you're there and you have one of these colonies and, you know, if the weather is, is unsettled, uh, we're living in Ireland. So, you know, this is our summers are generally tend to be very unsettled. So for a beekeeper, you know, you basically spend most of your time running in and out of the, from the rain. Um, 
So it's great to have colonies that require less management and you know that you can leave them for 14 days rather than seven days. Um, and uh, you know, they require much less attention than, than, than other colonies. Now, so I would just want to talk on swarm control. Uh, and this is when you go to the colony and uh, swarm preparations are underway. You're there, you're doing your regular inspections and you're looking for queen cells. And uh, then if your swarming is underway, then you must take action. Uh, and you must be prepared for this. Uh, there's no point looking for extra equipment when you, know, you suddenly see like, you know, that the colony is full of um, queen cells. Uh, now, you know, generally I would, you know, you doing your um, and the, when the, especially beginner beekeepers, uh, when they see queen cells in, um, in their colony, uh, the one thing, the first thing to do, uh, the first thing anybody rings me and that's, I say, I think it's a quote from the Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy, don't panic, right? If you see queen cells, don't, I mean, the swarm is not going to take off on that minute, unlikely to, on the minute you're at the hive. So it's pa always pause for thought. Um, so, you know, uh, it's happened so many times where I've seen beginners removing queen cells without checking first to see that the old queen was still there and she might have actually gone and there's no more larvae that are viable to be turned into queens. And that, you know, signals, you know, if you remove all the queen cells uh, and there's no young larvae left, then that is, unless you can uh, get help from a third party, that's, um, you know, the end of that colony. Um, so, you know, now, and what you're tempted to do then is you see queen cells and you destroy, and, and you, know, you know the queen is laying, you're, temp you're uh, tempted to just destroy the queen cells. And then you come back next week and you look again, there's more queen cells and you destroy those. And this is not a viable option. I mean, you know, it, it, it just won't work because the bees will always find a way. They just seem to get frustrated. What they'll start, what they'll start doing is that they will actually start preparing emergency queen cells. They can raise, you know, uh, queen cells from worker larvae, uh, and they can even rear queen cells from worker larvae that are six days old, and these obviously won't give you really good queen cells. Or they, you will find, you know, you're there, you're going to miss a queen cell. They're going to stick a queen cell somewhere awkward in the side of a comb, in a little hidden nook or cranny that the beekeeper won't be able to um, find. So this is, it's not a viable option to keep going back into the colony and uh, destroy the queen cells. Now, my general procedure, I might do this once. If I go to a colony and I see queen cells, I would give them one chance. And what I do is I'd remove all the queen cells on that one occasion. Uh, now, you, when you're looking for queen cells, it's important that you shake the bees off the brood frames because it's almost impossible to um, notice them all otherwise and then you remove you remove the queen cells uh but, you know i generally just take the larvae out and, and, and leave it there and destroy the cell i just do that once and then what i do is i'd make sure that they have enough room i'd make sure there's enough room in the brood box i'd make sure there's enough room for this uh, for uh in the supers um and i might take a frame or two of brood out and, and give it to another colony uh, and then but then i come back the next week uh, seven days later, and if they're still raising queen cells at this stage, then I consider it to be uh, we're in swarming, full swarming mode, and then you really have to take action then. Uh, now, you know, there is literally dozens and dozens of methods, methods of um, swarm control. Um, like uh, there's things like uh, Demery and Snell Grove, and loads of others. And, um, you know, it's great fun reading about them all. And some of them are very complicated. Some are just amazingly complicated. They're so technical. And uh, some work really technically work beautifully. Uh, just, just to see the, you know, the, the whole process uh, is beautiful. But a, a lot of them are quite, quite complex. Um, now, if effective methods supposedly approximate uh, the behavior of a real swarm. Now, um, you know, a real swarm, supposedly a, what happens is the old queen leaves with the old, older bees and heads off and leaves behind uh, the queen cells and the young bees. Now, recent research I was reading there recently 
seems to indicate that actually a swarm is much more heterogeneous than, than previously thought, and that uh, there is swarm contains a, um, a greater uh, mix of different ages in, in, the, in the swarm than previously believed. Uh, but you know, the design of most of these methods are designed to separate the older foraging bees from the younger bees. Um, and uh, the method you use depends also on how much colony increase you want. Um, you know, if you're happy enough that this colony is, say, as what I call the normal swarming colony, uh, and you want to increase your numbers of colonies, this is a very good way of doing so. I mean, you can split it up into uh, several nukes, so long as there's at least one good queen cell in each nuke. Um, and you can actually, you know, uh, uh, split up, uh, if it's a strong colony, you can split it up in quite a, quite a number of nukes and you, you would increase your number of colonies then. Um, and you should always have extra equipment for, for uh, because a lot of them, some of them take quite a lot of equipment. Uh, so you need to have it ready. Uh, any frames you need, uh, need to be ready. There's no point trying to make frames when the, the, when the swarm is just about to leave. Um, and also, you should practice, do a dry run on whatever method you use, just to get it clear in your head how it works, just using uh, equipment you have, just you know, in your garage or whatever, just pretend you're going through the whole procedure. Um, and you know, just be aware, I, when I used to give this talk live, I used to actually have the queen uh, in, uh, in, in indicated by a playing card of a queen of hearts or something. So you be able to follow where the queen moves, you know, when you're doing your manipulations on the, uh, you know, your swarm control method, you can visualize then where you're actually putting the queen. Uh, now, the, there's an important thing too, before you do, may do uh, go through any swarm control method, you should think, have one last think, should I be doing this? Because for instance, if you have a colony uh, that is very aggressive, you know, and it goes into swarming mode, there's not much point carrying out swarm control and splitting that colony uh, and possibly ending up with uh, you know, uh, another uh, colony that could be um, quite aggressive. Uh, so you might be a better option then might be actually to stop and uh, remove the queen and then think about maybe uh, introducing, um, say, a queen from a, a different colony uh, that has proven to be docile and you can do that quite easily you can just uh you know destroy all the queen cells and then come back in seven days destroy all the queen cells again and then just go and get a frame of uh, young larvae from say a docile colony and stick it into the into the hive there's nothing nothing left uh, to raise queen cells from so then they're forced to raise the queen cells from the larvae originating in the, in the docile colony so and it could be like it could be a colony that is prone to say disease like chalk brood. So you don't want to, you know, it might it might be a good opportunity to stop and take stock and decide whether you should actually remove the queen altogether and uh, try and you know um, introduce a you know um, a different a different a queen with different genetics. Um, so I'm just. Tonight, as I said, I'm just going to talk about uh, two quite simple uh, methods of swarm control. One is the um, uh, artificial swarm. This is also known as the Pangdon method. And this is loads of books. Now there is different versions of this um, and it's all, it always looks more complicated than it is. When you do this in practice, it is a very simple method. And if you actually practice this, as I said, like in your garage and do it, it is actually a very simple method. Uh, now, no swarm control method is 100% successful. Uh, I think if you're 90%, I would be confident that this is 90% successful. And it works well, especially early in the year. You do it early in the year, if the colony goes into swarming mode, uh, say, you know, in early May, this works really well. Uh, and it means you know you have, you can actually you have two viable colonies then for uh, the main honey flow in, in July. So here we have uh, we have our original parent colony, and we have the old queen in this, and then we have queen cells. So basically, what you do is uh, now I'm going to go through this like quite simply, but you know 
look this up if you need more information. You know. uh, so what you do basically then is you uh, take the brew box, uh, the original brew box, you move it to the side, just slightly to the side, um, you know, up to about maybe three feet to the side, no more than three feet to the side. And what you do, so in that then you find the frame, and sorry, you introduce a new uh, box in, the, in its place, in the original place, brood box, um, uh, with whatever frames you have, brood frame. Uh, if you've drawn combs, that's great. Uh, we, ideally, even if you have some drawn combs and some foundation. Um, and then what you do is you go to the box with the queen in it and you find her and you take that frame of brood and make sure that there's no queen cells on it and you put that back into the new box, which is on the original site. Um, and then the box that you moved across containing the, sea, the queen cells, what I would do is actually go through that and I would remove any sealed queen cells. Uh, now, as I said, there's different variations of this. This is, this is what I do. I've removed any sealed queen cells and leave just unsealed queen cells. Uh, and then you just put everything back together. Obviously, make sure that the one, the box that you moved across with the sealed queen cells, sorry, with the queen cells uh, has plenty of food. So then uh, a week later, you come back to this. And what you do, uh, Sorry, I'll just go back to this again. So when you do make this move, what you'll find that all the, the foraging bees from the blue box, which is the original box, will go back to the original site and enter uh, and join the old queen. So we have the, all the old bees will return to the original site. What you do then is a week later, you move that the blue box, the original box to its, uh, in this diagram, it's moved to the other side, but you can actually move it anywhere its final position in the apiary, wherever you want to move it in the apiary. And what will happen that any foraging bees that have emerged in the meantime uh, will actually return to the original side to the to join the old queen, uh, the red box there, the old queen. Um, and basically, then what will happen is that you get a new queen in the in the blue box in, the, in there. So you have new, two new colonies. I find that uh, works well. And even when I'm explaining here, it looks more complicated than it is. But if you actually just practice it yourself, it, it, it isn't. Uh, the general, basically, what you have is the old queen with the old bees on the old site. Right? And you have the new queen, which is the, you know, in the form of queen cells, with the new bees, which are young bees, on the new site. And that's how I try and remember it. Anyway. And so, you know, I find that that works. Um, it works. It works very well when it's early in the season. And when you perform this early in the season, it works very well, and you get a good new production colony out of it. If you perform it later on in the season, going into June, uh, heading towards the end of June, it will have. Uh, I find it will have a, a major effect on honey production because you're weakening a strong production colony. And in that case, then I used a, a second method, which is known as the nucleus method, which is also a very simple method. And you do this um, at any time as well, um, especially from kind of mid-May on, or any, well, you can do this as an alternative at any time, but it works, works really well. And so again, what we have here is the original collie with the old queen, and they start producing queen cells. So basically, simply what you do is you take the old queen, you take two frames of brood, uh, you know, and the bees are sticking on, making sure that there's no queen cells on those frames. You'll have to probably brush the bees off, uh, you know, if you don't want, to, if the queen is there, or, you know, you can put, take the queen off and just shake the bees into the brood, brood into the nuke box uh, and remove any queen cells on those frames. And then you throw in more bees, about two frames of bees, maybe. Um, and then, you know, if you're, you, and I, what I normally do then is I move that to another site, you know, another apiary site and set it up and that's fine. It won't produce any honey this year, but you, know, that's, uh, you prepare that for the winter and it's a viable colony going into the winter. Um, and, uh, or if, if you have only one apiary site and you can't move it, then what I would do is I would add in extra bees. I might put in maybe three or four shakes of bees 
Uh, now, and then you would put that in the dark for maybe 24 hours, making sure that it's well ventilated. So you use a nuke box with a, a mesh floor maybe, or if it doesn't have a mesh floor, put a screen on top of it uh, to make sure it gets plenty of air. And put that somewhere cool and dark for 24 hours. Um, and then you can set it up in your home apiary. And that, that works quite well. Uh, you will lose some bees back to the original site, but you've already put in, uh, throwing extra bees into it. Um, and, you know, putting it in the dark for that amount of time seems to uh, prevent the homing instinct of some, of some of the bees back to the original site. In the original colony, the blue box here, what you do is you remove all the cells except one unsealed queen cell. And what you do is get a thumbtack uh, and mark that on the frame to see where that, that, you know, to mark where that queen cell is so you know, know where it is for the next time. So you come back in seven days time and you go, first of all, to the, to the marked and make sure it's still there because sometimes it isn't. The bees might decide that they don't want the queen cell that you want and they will remove that. Uh, so you go back and check that it's there. Um, and then you go, because, because there was eggs and larvae in this colony, they still have the potential to raise more queen cells. So you go through it then and remove all the rest of those queen cells. So all you're doing is leaving one uh, queen cell. Now some, you, some beekeeping books, especially older ones will all say, sure, uh, you leave two queen cell, two queen cells in this box, uh, kind of like like um, an Irish statement to be sure, to be sure. But is a very risky st strategy leaving more than one uh, one queen cell because you know it, it would definitely, almost definitely swarm. It's a strong colony, it almost definitely swarm. Um, so um, thing about this method is you still have the old queen there in, in the other box on standby, and you know if things go wrong. You can always uh, later on in the season introduce her back in. Um, now, as uh, these are just two methods, and there's loads of variations just of these two methods um, alone. And um, so, but, but I find, and this works very well. Uh, I, I think this is like 90% successful again, um, and it works anytime, any time of the season. Um, and it's a great way, like, and as I said before. I, I probably forgot to say before, actually, when I was talking about there, when you were evaluating your queens, you know, if a queen is very old, you might also wonder whether you should, uh, you know, carry out swarm control methods because you will often find, even in nature, uh, when a, um, a swarm, a queen swarms, uh, they will shortly replace her when she arrives at the new home. They can actually supersede her very quickly. So you, you, you know, you want to be careful. Sorry, this is just something I forgot to mention there in the previous you know, talking about evaluating qu quality of queens before you initiate swarm control. So finally, if all things fail, then like you know, and you're not able to do your inspections, make sure you position bait or decoy hives around the apiary to catch any any swarms. Um, now this one is obviously too small. Uh, generally, I think forty liters. I think is Thomas Seeley. Um, calculators is the best size uh, for that. So uh, you could have one or two dozen apiary, and I find it depends on the year. You'll actually catch swarms from other beekeepers. Or uh, in Ireland, we're finding there's a lot more colonies now surviving in the wild, so you can actually collect um, uh, wild swarms, uh, which is great because these have been surviving for a certain amount of time without varroa control uh, and might carry some resistance. Uh, obviously, any swarm you get of unknown origin needs to be treated carefully uh, and examined for disease and all that. Uh, for a bait hive, I generally use, you know, I have a few, I have old hives that are, say, brood boxes that um, will pass their best before date. And I would, uh, and, you know, they'd be no good for overwintering a colony, but they're fine for putting out as a bait hive in the summer. And I put into that maybe an old, old comb. And uh, then some, I would often have um, steel, frames are steel. Often, you know, there's a, you, you go through, um, and there's a lot of combs, I say foundation that hasn't been drawn out properly or only half drawn out. And I find they're actually brilliant for putting into bait hives um, because uh, swarms are actually brilliant at um, drawing out comb. They have a, you know, when they arrive in a new home, first thing is they want to build as much comb as possible. 
Uh, so if you put in some, you know, uh, old uh, foundation that's only maybe partially drawn, I throw it in there and it's a great way. They repair all those frames for me. Um, it's really good. Um, I also put in as an attractant, I might put in, a, I have a little sponge and each inspection, then I just go to the decoy hive once a week and put a couple of drops of something like um, geranial oil or um, lemon balm oil um, or, or, or um, one, one of those uh, kind of uh, uh, strongly scented uh, oils you can, you can get um, and, and, and just put one or two drops on, on the sponge and, and leave it there. And that acts as an uh, attractant, I think, for foraging bees, I think, because uh, uh, they would end up being scouts. So they probably kind of remember where the, the, the bait hive was. And then when a swarm um, emerges, they will, you know, that will be one of the hopefully one of the candidate uh, locations that the swarm will go to. So I think that's it. I, uh, you know, I, as I said, you know, I tried to cover certain aspects in, you know, a certain amount of detail. It's a huge area, and I would advise you to read up more yourself. And and when you're reading up about swarm preparation, prevention, and control, be very aware of the area that you live in that to keep your bees, because beekeeping varies an awful lot say from uh, from Ireland to uh, and Scotland to the south of England to the Mediterranean to parts of, of the United States it varies so when you're reading up about you know swamp vegetation control try and you know see target information that it's that's directed at your area because it varies a lot and the swarming season varies hugely as well you know I'm talking about the Irish season here and there's, if there's anybody from the United States listen to me they're probably baffled by the the times I'm giving for, for swarming preparation and that. So that's it. Thanks for, for listening. Um, and Gaurav uh, Mahagrid. So do I stop share now, Brendan, or what? Yeah, sure. Um, up to you. It doesn't really matter. Do you want to go through the questions? Yeah, you're going. To, yeah, yeah. OK, absolutely. so with your weekly inspection, do you check every frame for queen cells? That's a very good question, actually. And I find um, I don't. Uh, I find that bees are very um, symmetrical. So basically what I do is I, you know, you go into like in the, my box, there's 12, 11 or 12, usually 12 frames. So I target where the brood nest is and I, I calculate roughly how many frames of brood there is. So, for instance, if there is there and there's eight frames of brood, I would examine half of that brood. So I'd work my way from the back in. So, you know, so I'd cover just more than half the brood nest. So if there's eight frames of there, I'd look at the five frames there. And if there's no queen cells on those uh, five frames, I'm confident that there isn't any on the other frames. Now, when I say confident, I'm probably 97% confident that there is, but it saves a lot of time. Uh, now you might miss, using this, you might miss supersedure cells. Uh, because they don't tend to be as symmetrical uh, in the sense in their distribution. But that, I mean, if you miss a super procedure cell by its nature, you're not going to lose a swarm, so that doesn't matter. I would have, but I, but I do have a very careful look at just over half the broodness. Okay. Um, somebody then comments saying, twice I managed to rescue the clip queen, picked her up from the ground after the colony swarmed. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. If you find it, if you find it, if you see a swarm that's just come out and you know your queen's clipped, look down on the ground. She can't, depending on how she's clipped, she can't get very far and have a good look. And it has happened to me several times. Um, and put her put her somewhere safe if you have a matchbox or something, put her somewhere safe until you and then go into the colony. And then you can do you can go carry on ahead. The, the, the bees will return to the hive, and then you can carry on ahead with your artificial swarm or your nucleus method of swarm control with, and reintroduce the queen to which, whichever way you do it, you know? Um, can you repeat the name of the method used for queen rearing? Uh, what I do, it's uh, the Varsman. He's uh, I'm trying to think of his first name. Uh, he's Dutch. Uh, and if you, if you Google it, I, now I use a modified version of it. I use a double nuke box. But it's Varsman, uh, V O R S T M A N, -N, and I find it very, very. If you're 
interested in raising bees and nukes as well. It's a, it's a very uh, useful method. Okay. Just a, a question on that though. When you split them, do you move them away to somewhere else? Because I've tried it and they all moved into two. Yeah, this, initially when I did this, um, I did this, I was fascinated and I would arrange say five nukes around the, the, where the double one was and uh, then I'd distribute the bees. And for I just could not get an even distribution of bees. So what I do now is that I um, basically uh, make up my nukes, uh, close them and leave them there and then come back in the evening and take all the nukes together and move them to a different site. It's the only way I can ensure an even distribution of the bees from, from the parent box. Um, okay. That was that one. Um, what's the earliest a hive has ever swarmed on you? Yeah, the earliest I've seen, I think I mentioned it there, was uh, April the 24th. Uh, it was a uh, it was a friend of mine and it was uh, we had good weather earlier and there's a huge field of oilseed rape uh, right beside him and he was a little bit slow to get off the mark and the, the house swam. Yeah. Yeah. This is obviously under Irish conditions, yeah. yeah. How long in advance can you put the foundation out of the frame to have it ready for use? Sorry, say that again now? So how long in advance can you put foundation into the frame to have it ready for use? Oh yeah, right. Well, um, once you get to this time of year, when it gets starts getting a bit warmer, you know, I think it's fine, um, you know, to leave it to, to make it up now, um, and just make sure it's out of the sun, you know, that it's. Um, and if you're worried about it, if you're worried about foundation that you've made up and you think it's been there a little bit too long, just get a hair dryer and gently, just gently, uh, run it over the the, the wax, uh, very gently, not to melt, melt it, but just to. Uh, sometimes you get an oxidation on, on the surface, but there's no problem making up foundation now. Uh, sunlight is, is, has a worse effect than, than temperature and, and wax this time. Um, if I have three colonies, what extra equipment do you recommend I have on standby to cope with possible swarming? Well, in theory, like now, if you were using artificial swarm, then you would have to have three um, extra sets of equipment. Now, if you want to, if you want to end up with six hives, that's fair enough. Um, so you would have to have enough equipment for three more hives. But the artificial swarm can also be carried out without actually splitting the hive. You know, if you don't want to increase your colony, I won't go into it now, but you can actually carry out the artificial, just look it up, um, you know, the variations of the artificial swarm and you can actually carry it on if you don't want to increase the number of hives you have and you can just, without splitting the, the colony um, and uh, you, know, uh, you can carry out the artificial swarm that way. And there's other methods, the Demery method can be used without, if you don't want to go to the trouble of making up new hives. But if you want to carry out, uh, if you have three colonies and they're a good strength, you kind of have to presume that the three of them will go into swarming mode. Um, and you know, the thing is, if they, it shows that they're strong colonies, if, usually, if they go into the swarming mode. So, and if you're happy enough, then you should have enough for three more hives. Um, why leave the unsealed queen cells instead of closed? Queen yeah, this is now, and this is kind of quite hard to explain. Uh, in, you know, if you see it happening, right, first of all, I'm going to do, a, you know, you move the, the, the box containing the unsealed uh, the queen cells is going to be moved a second time, seven days later. So there is, if you left sealed queen cells, there's a possibility <clears throat> that a virgin queen can hatch out of the, one of those queen cells in the, you know, uh, if you just leave sealed queen cells. So when you move that box over to somewhere else, that virgin queen has, will, might be out mating. And when she returns, her box is gone and she'll actually fly into the original colony. The second reason you would use unsealed queen cells is actually you can look into unsealed queen cells and see that they're all okay and that they're you know and they, you know generally better. But its main reason is you know just on the off chance that a virgin queen might emerge and has gone off uh, mating in the meantime. Um, what if you can't find the old queen using the artificial method? Um, yeah, I presume this means if, um, say, the queen isn't isn't marked, 
but you can still actually carry out the artificial swarm uh, when you can't find the queen. And I've done, I've done it for somebody once uh, and it worked really, really well. Now it's a little bit awkward. What you do is, uh, uh, well, first of all, all I say is that you can use the artificial swarm and just again, just it's a variation on the artificial swarm. It involves moving, uh, say, taking out, brushing all the bees from the brood into the new box, right? And then putting the box with all the, uh, the brood empty, no, with no bees on it, up on top. All the nurse bees will go up through the excluder and join the, the, the brood up above in the top box and the queen cell is there. And, but the queen obviously can't go through the, um, the excluder, so she's trapped below on the bottom box. And then the following day or two, you can come back and do your, uh, no, no, you, the queen will be in the bottom box and you can do your artificial swarm then. Um, in the new method of swarm, you say put the bees in the dark. Is that just closing down the entrance? Uh, yeah, you close the entrance, but you put them, no, you put them into somewhere uh, cool and dark. So a shed or garage that's dark. And, and, and cool, like you don't want them to overheat. Now this is Ireland, so you know, not much chance of overheating anyway. But you know, if you you know, if it's much warmer, you would put them into a cellar or something like that. But make sure that they're well ventilated. So either you have a a floor, a mesh floor on it, or a screen board on top to allow them to continue breathe. And you you know, 24 hours or even more, and uh, just leave them there in the dark, and, and you'll be fine. Um, that one again, about the name enforcement. Um, okay, what is Owen's preferred method of swarm control that he uses himself? Does it change according to the period, stroke, time in the swarming season? To me, yeah, no, no to me, the, I would almost exclusively use the nucleus method because it's just you need less equipment. Um, and uh, Generally, I'm going from apiary to apiary, so it's very handy for me to take a, a nuke. I, I'd be going on to a new apiary anyway, uh, as I'm carrying out, and uh, I bring it with me. Um, and so it's, 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 I just find handy. And also, you know, I'm taking away less bees from the production colony. I'm, you know, full-time honey producer, so I want my production colony as quite as strong as possible. So I find that just taking the queen away in a nuke is, is, serves me. I, and I would do that probably more than 90% of the time. Okay. Um, what do you mean by a very old queen? Yeah, well, when I say old queen, uh, you know, um, I strong believer in that it's not so much age uh, is the problem. Uh, you know, so some queens age better than others, like humans, obviously. But um, I, I would say, you know, generally I have queens that are just four years old and that I will hold on to. And I have queens that are two years old that I would regard as, you know, probably, uh, you know, at the end of their life. So you can kind of know from their laying pattern and their productivity over the years. Um, I, like I never, I don't replace my queens. Like the books will say replace your queens every two years. I don't, I, I, I would only, you know, I would assess each queen. Um, I, I have queens, I have a four year old queen uh, that has never never raised queen cells and is one of my strongest colonies every year. Um, and so, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't regard her as, you know, worth replacing. You know, I wouldn't. She she doesn't deserve to be replaced. You know? Whereas others, you know, might be younger than her. And uh, just looking at their performance and that, I would replace. Okay. Um. How do you get drawn uh, brood combs, combs? How would you get, get drawn, drawn brood combs? Uh, yeah, right. So it's important. And I forgot to mention this earlier, of course, that, you know, uh, colony journey doesn't start swarming until there's drones available, because obviously there's no point having queens out mating if there's no drones available. But, you know, when queens go into uh, swarming mode, you know, there'll be young queens that need to be mated. So it's very important that you supply plenty of drones, especially in these days where your know, Varroa prefer preferentially targets drones. So I think the drones are getting uh, a, a bad deal really. And the amount, you know, the amount of drones 
that, uh, sorry, the amount of, say, Fairchild drones that are available is not as much as it used to be. So it's really up to the beekeeper to make sure that their colonies, especially their good colonies, produce as many drones as possible. So what I would do is I would say take a drone comb that is maybe, you'll often find, especially if you use an open mesh floor, that the bottom of the brood combs tend to start getting stale. And so what I would do is I would cut maybe a half or two thirds of that uh, comb away. Uh, and I just use a really sharp knife. It will cut through the wire and all. If it doesn't, you can use a, a snips or a strong scissors. And you cut through and you, what you do is you cut away, say, if the bottom two thirds of the comb away and leave it empty. Put that into the brood nest. Uh, you know, this time of year is still a little bit early. So you put it at the, not even close to the brood nest, but say in about, you know, it probably needs to be near the brood nest in the next, you know, a few weeks time. Uh, that space, they will invariably raise drone comb in that space. Uh, you know, if they're strong, if the colony is strong enough and they they feel they need drone comb, they will fill it. If they don't need drone comb, they'll fill it with worker brood. So there's no thing, you're not forcing the colony to produce too much drone brood because they won't if they don't want to. And you have to remember like that, um, the you know, the foundation you put in our colonies is all worker brood. Um, so uh, work, worker comb. So it's really important that you provide them uh, the opportunities. And I would put, I would generally have maybe two frames containing, you know, a half to two thirds of drone comb in my uh, brood box. And if it's a really good hive, I'd have actually three of those in there uh, and leave them produce drones. Actually, I think the question was, how do you get drawn comb? You know, how oh, do you right. get <laughs> but, but that's okay because no, that I, can answer, I can answer that one too. Drawn comb, like it's difficult. Well, this time of year here, it's, it's still cold. So if you want to put in foundation into your column this time, you'll have to feed. And I feed it one to one, one to one syrup. Uh, later on in the year after the harvest, you could just get um, a brood box of foundation and uh, put it on top of a strong colony and just feed it and they'll draw that out um, and then you'll have a store it over the winter and have it in, in, in the springtime. Um, uh, how far does the queen fly to a DCA? That that varies, uh, you know, it varies um, and there, there's been a certain amount of work on this but uh, you know it's and mostly with, uh, I think, with uh, Carniolan bees. Uh, and they found Jenny the Queen. Um, I'm trying to, and it could be, I'm trying to remember rightly now. I think the Queen will generate, they found studies done in Austria and Germany found that Jenny the Queen will fly not to the nearest drone congregation area, but the next nearest drone congregation area. Um, whereas drones tend to fly to the nearest congregation area. So, you know, a queen can go, you know, no problem going three miles to, to a drone congregation area to get, to get measles. But, but probably anywhere between half a mile to three miles, I would say. Is there a particular direction for a bait hive to be set? Uh, not in my experience. Um, I just tend to put it in the apiary. You have to remember when the bait hive is full of bees, you know, if you do attract a swarm, you will have to get those that hive somewhere down. So if you put it up very high uh, on a pole, for instance, you'll have to find some way of getting it off down off the pole. What I tend to do is if there is a spare space in my apiary, say an empty um, hive stand with an empty space, I would tend to put a few extra old boxes on top of that and then put the, uh, the bait box on top of that. So it's a little bit higher up. You know, ideally, it should be as high as possible, but obviously, you know, it has to be practical. So I put it up, say, maybe I put three empty boxes that are, say, no longer of any use and put the bait hive on top. So I can, when the swarm arrives, then I can take away, every week, I can take away a box and gradually bring it down to the proper level, you know. So, you know, height is important. Uh, swarms prefer going to, um, uh, you know, locations that are high, but it has to be practical as well. I don't think the direction matters really, you know, but uh, because I could be wrong on that now and probably Thomas Ely, Thomas Ely's book is where to look for that if you want to find out. Um, what was the name of the first artificial swarm method? Uh, that I mentioned, it's, it's, it's often known as the Pagden method. 
Um, okay. Uh, what's the dimensions of a 40 liter box? Uh, I think, I think uh, a national brew box used in Ireland is roughly 40 liters, not far off, I think. Yeah. If I, I, could be, I could be contradicted and get, might be getting my measurements and my uh, feet, and, feet and inches mixed up with my uh, centimeters, but I, I think it's roughly the size of a, um, a national brew box. Um, how far does the drone fly to a DCA? Oh uh, yeah, well yeah, the, the drones tend to fly to the nearest, uh, generally the nearest one, and that, but they can they can qu travel quite quite a distance, you know. Um, I think there's like, and I think you know it hasn't been really proved, but there's, um, you know, some anecdotal evidence that drones will, can actually stop off at different apries along the way. Uh, I know, I think somebody has done experiments over in the west where the drones have. A drone, a marked drone, and found them traveling large distance, probably by going from apiary to apiary, you know. Uh, so, but generally, they when mating, they go to the nearest you know, drone congregation. Yeah. Uh, how do you commonly decide to stay with one version or go on to send out small casts, which will probably not survive? Why was it, why How does a colony decide to stay with one virgin queen? Or it, it, it's, yeah, if you knew if you knew the answer to that, uh, yeah, it's it's hard to know why. And even the whole process of throwing out casts seems to be like these casts, especially in Irish conditions, would never survive. There's not practically no chance at all of surviving. Like a prime swarm in the wild has a low chance of, of survival, whereas a cast, uh, but is definitely some. There's obviously a genetic thing because you will find that some colonies are very prone to throwing out lost of casts. Um, sorry, someone has just flashed up the national brood box is 37 liters. Um, but um, so, um, what was that question again? <laughs> um, oh, casts. Yeah, sorry. So you'll find that some colonies are just, they just have a propensity for throwing out casts, whereas others will just do a sw prime swarm and no more. It's it's obviously some kind of genetic thing, and um, you know it probably might vary between different subspecies as well. I don't. I don't, I don't yep. know. Any comments on Snell Grove boards? Um, yeah, they're absolutely. It's a beautiful method. Uh, there's a, uh, an old beekeeper in RD here, one of the first beekeepers I met when I moved up to uh, County Loud more than 20 years ago. Uh, and he's practiced the Snell Grove method and swore by it. And he had these beautiful Snell Grove boards and it worked perfectly. But, you know, it is a little bit, uh, well, I said, you say to him that it's a little bit complicated. And he said, well, it isn't really, but he had been doing it for, I don't know, he started beekeeping in the 1930s, I think. So he'd been doing it all that time. So it wasn't complicated to him, but, you know, it involves, um, opening these little um, gates in, in, in the board, but you know, it worked perfectly for him and it works, it, but he was there on, on standby. So every day he was in his apiary and he would go down and switch these different gates and, and, um, and Snell Grove method, uh, Snell Grove board. But uh, it's, an, it's an, uh, really, I'd say it's very successful, but might technically it might be a little bit difficult to get a handle on initially. Um, in the artificial swarm, do you remove all the unsealed cells except one? I no, I don't. No, no, nothing. Because uh, when I'm doing this, I'm doing a second switch, right? You know, I do. I move and uh, I move the colony a second time. You know, um, so there's you know, but I do remove all. As I said, remove all the sealed queen cells. So there's no need to remove the unsealed. Now, if you're only doing one switch, yes, I would just leave one. Uh, unsealed queen cell, but you would have to come back seven days later as well to remove any other ones that have been raised in the meantime. Just just a comment, there are two links here. One is to Tom Seeley's um, uh, bait hives for honeybees. Oh the, yes, that, yes. That, uh, yeah, yeah. Paper. And the other one looks like it's a link to the Borsman method. Oh, yes. So, yeah. uh, I haven't reversed my supers yet, is weather going cold again? And it, so he had nadeared them under the brood box, or she had. Will this contribute to swarming versus reversing super early on top of the brood box? Uh, so, obviously, so they put the, 
yeah, it's hard to know. There's a what's known as the one and a half system, where some people use in Ireland, where and uh, Britain, where you put a a, a super a national super on top of a national brew box as an extra uh, brood, uh, and often uh, people put that underneath in the in the um, in the autumn, and then or or they put it on top and then put it underneath in the springtime. Um, I don't, I've never, used, I used that method years and years ago. Uh, I haven't, re, it involves a certain amount of manipulation. It all depends. She has the, uh, the super underneath at the moment, uh, for the winter. So, I mean, there should be, that should be, you know, there should be no brood really as such in that. So, I mean, the first available opportunity, so long as there's no brood and she can make sure that the queen is not in it and there's no ivy honey in it, uh, she could move back up to the top, um, uh, in, you know, the first available opportunity, I think. You know. Yep. And somebody looking for, how oh, you spell Vorstman again. Just use the link up above. There's a, a just above it from uh, Alexei, I think is the, the link. Um, uh, um, Jane Axel, oh, what's... I'm sorry. What's the uh, earliest time of year in the south of England that you can do a split and have enough local drones to mate the emergent queen? Uh, I don't know. I, I presume earlier than in Ireland, anyway. Um, you know, in in the earliest time in Ireland would be if you carry it, it would be first week of May generally. Um, I presume it's much earlier in the south of England. I, I don't. She would have to ask somebody locally. No. Uh, Let's see. Um, in nucleus method of swarm control, if you take away the box to a new location, what's the shortest distance? Oh yeah. Well, generally, they say three miles. You know, uh, you know. I would say at least two miles anyway. You know, um, you know. Basically, if you're within the three miles, you might have to put extra bees into it. Uh, but you know, I think two miles plus, you're safe enough. I think you know. Do you always smoke your bees when doing the weekly inspections? I generally do, yeah, yeah, but but I would use very little little smoke. Uh, uh, like I know some people use a spray, a water spray. Um, I, I've never really taken to that method, and but I know it works really well for some people. I, I find uh, with smoke, and I mean, you know, really the big thing when you're beekeeping is the control of the smoker is one of the biggest skills you have to master, and I think it's really all about. Uh, controlling the smoker. Uh, the one thing I find with using a spray, water spray, it the bees, you know, are obviously calm, but they don't move out of the way. They actually tend to stay static. Whereas with a, if you a little light puffs of smoke, it's great for just moving the bees out of, out of the way. So I, I would always use a smoker. Yeah. You know, and even you know, even if the bees are very docile and you you know it's just you know there's less crushing of bees and I think it's much easier way of handling them and there's less danger of uh, them, them being damaged or crushed. Or um, let's see, how far can I move my split away from the mother colony? Uh, right, this is the artificial swarm, I presume. Mm -hmm. and, well, the first split, so when that, the method I showed up, you, the first split, you know, you have to keep it quite close, about, you know, three feet. It has to be the nearest, the nearest colony to your home. Uh, the original hive. So whether that means, you know, whatever, you, whatever, two or three feet. Um, and then the second, then when your second move, you can move to anywhere within your apiary. You know, it doesn't matter. If you have a spot uh, on a hive stand that's free, then at the second move, you can move it there because all the foraging bees will just return to their original site. Um, when using the nucleus method, can you put the nuke next to the parent hive and orient it 180 degrees? Um, the nurse bees would stay, I guess, and you would lose the flying bees. Would the nuke be strong enough with just the nurse bees if you feed it? Yeah, well, you can do you can do the no, it wouldn't, I don't think. But what you can do if you, as I said, if you put that uh, in the dark, you know, for whatever 24 hours, uh, you know, I find that some of the bees uh, will lose their orientation um, and then there's no problem then putting it beside the other one and uh, it means then of course that if something goes wrong with the original hive you can requeen it with the old queen 
Uh, you know, so you know, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. I think just the important thing is that if you put it just there uh, straight away without putting it uh, somewhere else for a while, for you know, to, you know that that you're going to lose all the foragers, and, and you just will not be uh, enough bees, uh, nurse bees there to keep keep the brood warm. You know? Um, what do you think of performing a demerae uh, for swarm prevention? Um, how many, at how many brood friends would you advise to initiate this manipulation? So first of all, yeah, demerae, absolutely brilliant. I have I used the demerae about once or twice. I know a couple of beekeepers who swear by it. It's a brilliant way of, um, uh, what's the word, um, getting rid of old combs, of recycling old combs. Uh, but that's all I'm afraid that's all I know about it and I just admit ignorance really uh, about the rest of it you know if the swarm if a swarm goes into a national brood box as a bait hive how do you put in empty frames well there should be empty frames in it already so this is important in your bait box you should have frames in your because if if you have an empty bait box and the swarm arrives, it's amazing how quickly they will fill that comb. If the weather is good, um, so you would your bait box has to contain frames. So I would not, I would like, as I said, I put in stale foundation. I put in one old comb in there, but I put in stale uh, foundation. If you know, if I have it. Um, if you haven't a lot of foundation, like if you don't have any lot of frames, you can put it in. Um, what's it called? Um, a dummy board. So put in a dummy board in there as well. That maybe at the back. Uh, that you know that's hanging there. Like it's still the bee. I don't think it takes away much from the bee's perception of the size of the of the bait box. But it means that you don't have to use put as many frames into the bait box. But yes, it is. And I know people. I know people who have put like they have a bait hive and they put three or four frames in there and come back and found that the bees have like filled those frames and then also pull wild comb and the rest of it you know so it's amazing how quickly a swarm they're just amazing at building comb I, i've been called a couple of occasions to swarms i've entered um compost bins and it is just absolutely amazing the amount of comb they have they build in a couple of days you know. um if you put this super below a brood box in winter be, uh, because the honey because the honey isn't capped and then use rural strips in autumn can the super be moved back on top to collect honey this year uh yeah i mean i i, I don't see i don't use any um any road tripping that says would leave residue so I, i'm not certain about that i don't think to i think officially you're not supposed to um because the chance of residues, but I can't be corrected on that. I think we'd have to ask somebody with a bit more experience in, in, in that. You know, I think theoretically, uh, you know, if the you're not supposed to have supers on when you're using, um, when you're using, say, uh, um, you know, miticides, uh, hard chemical miticides, unless that super is intended just for rearing brood. But if it's used for, if you want to use it as a super in the future, I think. Theoretically, but but person will have to ask somebody with with, with more experience in in, in using um, those uh, strips. I, I presume they mean when they say varroa strips, they mean something, oh like the apivar or something. Yeah, 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 or apivar or something. Is it or whatever one of those? Yeah. Do you wear gloves when handling production colonies, nukes, or apiteas? Um, I I do. I used to. I used to uh, wear gloves. Um. Uh, but there, um, what happened? Um, I am a big believer in hygiene, apiary hygiene. So I wash my hands uh, before, uh, after I've um, done an inspection colony, I wash my hands and my, uh, my um, hive tool and my smoker. And I found that if you, and I use um, washing soda, and I find if, found if you continue putting bare hands into washing soda, even though it's a very mild, basic solution yeah it does have uh, effects after a while so i use these really thin um nitrile gloves uh the bees can still sting through no problem 
uh, especially the fingertips, but it means they're very easy to clean. Uh, so, um, and then it just means it's much easier to, to you clean them and you, I have a wire brush in the uh, wire scouring pad in my bucket containing plastic solution. So it's very easy to get to, to clean the gloves and, you know, uh, and uh, after subjecting my hands to, um, and you're still able to, I'm still able to catch the queen with those gloves and I do, Hold the frames is just they're very very thin over my, my skin so it's actually they provide no protection as far as stings are required but they do keep they're much better for as far as hygiene um not using a queen excluder does this delay or prevent a swarm um it in theory it probably would prevent swarming but if you have your queen laying in your super now i, I don't know if this person is irish uh, because I know in other uh, you know, other countries, it, it, it dip, dip, uh, in, in Ireland, you basically, in my opinion anyway, have to use a queen excluder because the queen will generally just start moving up through the supers and laying in them. I know in warmer countries where they have very heavy flows of honey, uh, basically they often don't use an excluder because the amount of honey coming in will actually force the queen to stay below um, in the brood box or brood boxes. Um, so if you allow the queen up into the super, okay, you know, you might end up with a lot of brood stretched out over the supers and it might delay um, uh, swarming, but you will find, uh, and my, my, you'll often find that the queen will move up through the supers and that you, you know, you, when you go to harvest that honey later on, it becomes very difficult because you have, you have brood in so many supers. Um. If you have an overwintered super of ivy, do you suggest you scratch the comb and temporarily place under the brew box in the spring so that the bees transfer the ivy into the brew box? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the best way of dealing with it. Now it'll take a while. So, and there is, if you don't want the queen to lay in that super, then, you know, you would have to put it in the queen excluder. Um, and um, when I, I don't, um, it's, you know, I harvest my ivy now, so it's not so much a problem. But when I used to do this, I used to leave, I used to pull, the, I used to use, uh, say, not a framed queen excluder, but say either, a, you know, just a plain a sheet of, you know, whether it's plastic or, or metal. And I would just pull it back a little bit to allow, say, bees carrying pollen to walk up the inside of the super, if you know what I mean. I just bring it back, leave, pull it back, say, so that the, if you know the front of the first frame is not covered in the bottom box. So then, you know, they will, it'll take a while, depending on the strength of the colony, they will remove the ivy, but it'll take a while. Um, and so every inspection just, you'll find they'll actually probably remove the ivy from the middle of the box quicker. So, you know, when you come to it, you can start taking uh, frames from the out, from the Front and back, and move them into the center, you know, uh, in the next inspection. But it will take it will take a while, but they will do it, and they will use that ivy. They won't restore that ivy, honey. They will use it for brood rearing, and it's a good. Um, uh, the bees don't like honey underneath, especially Irish bees don't like honey underneath them, and they will remove it uh, if they can, um, and and they'll convert it into brood. Um, okay. So your queen rearing colony you described with the double nucleus could you do this with just some natural brood also have you any issues with the bees fighting if you're putting them in from many hives i oh, yeah, that's the force mill again so yeah so basically no first of all the last bit first no no fighting ever never ever any fighting uh i so i take frames of brood out of my colonies and so these frames could be coming from as many as 10 different colonies uh, and there's never, now most, a lot of these be probably nurse bees, um, so which won't fight anyway, but there's such a jumble, you know, there's always the old beekeepers that say, if you want to, it's better, easier to unite three colonies than two colonies, because it seems to create a bit of a um, confusion and they're less likely to fight. But, you know, you put, there's never been any issue whatsoever um, of, of fighting, they, they, they've, they've no problem. So as I said, as many, uh, up to 10 different colonies will provide Combs or that box. Just, I, I don't know what the first part of that question was. Was um, could you? I'm not sure what he's doing. Saying could you do just do this with a natural brood? I'm not sure. What yeah, you're... just frames of brood. Yeah, yeah. Just for, you're just taking and you, what you do is you take full frame sealed frames of brood because uh, that that's the brood that's going to hatch 
quickest. And you go, they're going to be young, hatch out as young nurse bees with nothing to do because they, they'll have no larvae to feed. Um, so, yeah. That's the, okay, so, and we, okay, it's a little quick summary of it again, but the link for it is just up above. Yeah. And just actually, just a comment on that about them fighting. I think I remember reading in his paper that um, he said you could be as rough as you like, unlike everything else in beekeeping. Because the more you shake them up, the more less yeah, likely. Right? Yeah, I've seen articles from old uh, beekeeping magazines, and they actually, when they unite two colonies, they often give uh, the hive a few kicks and shakes and everything, just to create and smoke is really well to create as much confusion as possible, and that seems to help. Uh, okay, so he actually, he's just commented again. He mentioned using a single national brew box, so but that's not the. That's oh yeah, the idea behind it. Yeah, and that's like I use a modified version. So the original Versman, uh, uh, Yerwin, Yerwin Versman, a uh, very good beekeeper in the Netherlands, and um, he uses a, a single brood box. But I just use a double nuke because it's uh, so easy to move. It's so handy, like you know, it's you can move it. So I can go from apiary to apiary, and you know, uh, as I'm going along, take combs out of strong colonies, and then close up the box, put it in my van and move on to the next apiary. And uh, it's just so transportable. That's why I use a double, but it, in the original, I use a single brood box. Uh, it's the same, but the principle is the same. Okay, so the last question is, where will we able, be able to find the recording? And I just put it up on the FIPCA uh, YouTube channel. So it'll be available there. Um, just a comment on that is that I lost connectivity halfway through, so there's uh -huh. probably five or ten minutes of it missing, but, but other than that, I spliced the bits together that I have. <laughs> okay, so, so that's it. Thank you very much for your time and your patience. Everybody, uh -huh. uh, lots of thanks in the, in the chat and everywhere. So anyway, so once again, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming along. Thanks and again, uh, I'll talk to you again, on. So. Right, Brendan. Thanks a million. All right, thank you. Okay, take Good night, care. everyone.